Thanks all for coming. I'm um, excited to be here. Thanks for the panelists, especially to, for uh, agreeing to come on. It's going to be a really good conversation we're going to have today. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about outdoor AR is it's sort of the, the, the holy grail of AR. It represents some of the hardest problems, the biggest challenges, and it's something that, that we haven't really seen at scale yet. People have talked about it. You've read novels maybe about it, seen it in movies. Uh, we're going to talk about the reality of outdoor augmented reality today. Uh, and just as a, as a way to kind of give you a glimpse as to how unreal a lot of this is, if you just take a look at this picture that we're, we're starting with here, it's a picture of a person holding up a phone and seeing the world augmented, but where are the annotations? They're, they're not on the phone, <laughs> they're out in space. So how is this person seeing this? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and that's kind of what happens when you start looking at the space, the stuff that might have seemed easy and intuitive, and it winds up being really hard, very challenging. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with some amazingly smart people over the years. Uh, I like that you said that I, I, I own these patents. I don't, I don't own them. I assigned them to the companies that I worked for. Uh, I would love to have owned them. But uh, I got to work on some really fun projects. And let me give you some examples. So I've been doing this for over 25 years, coming up on 30 years uh, pretty soon, and plenty of patents. Um, uh, some of which you know, were very future looking, some of which represented easy things that we got done right away. Um, the kind of role that I normally worked in was as a prototyper. So I would start really early on projects when there was nothing, it was all blue sky, and just start throwing things together and seeing what worked. Um, and the purpose of that was to help the big companies figure out the space, help them figure out what was gonna be uh, important. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but that's my experience. I don't, I'm not the person who builds the final uh, version of the things. I'm the person who helps kick it off and show what's possible, which I think uh, might be a little bit relevant today. Uh, I left Apple um, in, in January. There was a few articles about it, and I've been working on my own stuff uh, ever since. I'm happy to come back and um, talk about um, uh, all the stuff we're going to talk about today. I'm glad that I'm not on the panel. I don't have to answer hard questions. I get to ask the questions, uh, so this will be fun. Uh, so they had asked me to just put together a little bit of a primer on what is outdoor augmented reality. So I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes in talking about that, and then hopefully I won't be talking too much. I'll just be asking questions from that point on. Uh, so the key idea is there's this analog world that we live in. Uh, we're used to seeing it all the time, but it's very hard for computers to understand that world. It's very hard to write a program that can operate in the real world because it doesn't know. It, it has a camera maybe, but what we really need to do is to understand the world well enough that a program running on a phone or any other device could take that and use it. And so you think of it as a digital interface to analog reality. And that interface opens up all sorts of possibilities that uh, some of the companies on stage are, are working to, uh, to make real. Um, ideally, content can be anywhere and everywhere. Uh, that may or may not be a good idea. And if you look at the popular conception of these things, you have uh, things uh, like um, Iron Man with his great, you know, interesting UI. Uh, that's not really possible today. Uh, it's really hard to do uh, all the kinds of things that are shown there. You have some really great videos. Um, the one in the lower right was done by uh, a friend of mine. It's called Hyper Reality, and it's this great depiction of what happens when ad-driven content is everywhere and it's oppressive. What is that world like? It's a very dystopian look at what the future could be. And anybody working in this space has seen that video, and he's, he's quite well known. And the one above it is a sort of semi-creepy view of what happens when you're using it in the dating world, How, what happens when you can see information about other people. Um, these are all the popular conceptions. Some of them are realistic, some of them aren't. So let's talk about what's, what's real today. So as of today, we have exactly one major hit, which is called Pokemon Go. Uh, it, you might have played it, you might have seen it. Um, it's not really that AR. A lot of people who are purists about it say, well, okay, you can see the Pokemon in space, but you don't really need to do that to play the game. So, but it got everybody saying AR, AR, AR. So success, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it spurred a lot of investment, it got people excited, that's all great. Um, one of the problems, and I think we'll, we'll talk about this more uh, with, with the folks who are doing handheld AR, is that um, holding up your phone and looking at the world through the phone is a little bit awkward still. It's not something people are willing to do for very long periods of time, so designing experiences have to be very, like they like to call this snackable. You, know, you take it out, you do something, you put it away, you take it out uh, repeatedly. And it has to be interesting enough, and Pokemon was a good example of something interesting enough to get everybody to, to do it repeatedly, even using two or three phones sometimes. People really went all out. Uh, with it. Um, but the question is, what other hits can we come up with? And, and uh, folks on stage are working hard to think about that. Like, there need to be more hits, there need to be more uh, greater diversity of things that you can do. Um, and that's really going to be one of the things that drives this whole space forward. 
So uh, this is a rough stab at market size projections. It's really anyone's guess. Don't take these numbers as anything more than me doing some Google searching and coming up with what seemed uh, reasonable based on other people's estimates. Uh, I think that the takeaway from this is that some of the things we normally think about, like games, like Pokemon Go counts maybe in the games category, are, are really, those markets are small, even though they make a lot of money, they made a ton of money, compared to things like communication, the general space that we're in. And if you think that the future of outdoor AR is effectively going to be taking our phone and replacing it with something where it's visual and it's around us, that's got to be a huge market. I mean, you can't prove it, but if you just think about the size of the cell phone market today and translate that into a future where you're wearing maybe something on your face or some other technique, um, that's going to be really large. And, and that's not just the communication uh, vertical, but, but quite a lot of them. So, so pretty impactful and, and important to understand. Uh, these apps that I mentioned, this digital interface to analog reality, they need to understand the world because they need to be able to tell you about it. They need to be able to relate things. So they need to know the shape of the world, the texture of the world, the meaning of places. Ultimately, also people and things. You can't forget about those. People, places, and things covers the gamut of everything we need to know. So um, algorithms, computer vision algorithms, other machine learning algorithms are getting better at digesting this information and putting it back out there. But it also raises a whole bunch of other concerns about privacy, especially when you start talking about people. Uh, scalability, it's also hard. That um, I've heard stories about what needed to happen to make Pokemon Go scale. Right? I don't think they expected the success to be as big as it was. And it required teams of 100 uh, Google engineers, really, who owned the backend infrastructure to jump on and make it happen and make it possible. And it was not easy by any means. So, what does this all lead to? That something that I jokingly like to call the World Wide World. Uh, it's kind of think of it as the World Wide Web, but it's about the real world. It's about everything around there. So eventually we'll have this world built. Some people call it the mirror world. Some people call it the AR cloud, but the definitions really vary. But I think of it from a user perspective, it's really that data. It's, it's the web, but it's not this abstract space of interconnected links. It's everything we normally see, all digested in a form that computers can understand. Uh, and apps can use. And then it raises huge questions about who owns that. Nobody really owns the web, right? Even the communication companies who own the fiber that it runs off of have to kind of share with everybody else and everybody makes money. But, um, but the ownership is very distributed. And right now, a lot of the major companies are all racing to, to build these things. And they would very much like to be the company that owns it. And so how is that going to happen? And we're going to ask the panelists with their views on, on how that's going to come together as well. Uh, and finally, just to leave you with some thought, and this is something we'll also ask the panelists about, um, you may start with this idea of putting everything out there, but as of today, if you hold up your phone, you don't see a lot. There's not a lot of content down there. And, and before that content shows up, people have to believe. They have to go have a reason to go put it out there. So there's this idea that it goes from being a desert all the way up to being saturated with way too much stuff, like the web today, and eventually you need the equivalent of a Google to come in and write a search engine that will help us filter and find what we want and what we need. Uh, that doesn't really exist yet. Well, Google is there, and, and Google might have a good shot at, at pulling it off. Uh, but even then, you have also things like we see today on Facebook, like filter bubbles. Will I only see what I want to see? Will I only see the things that I'm comfortable with? Do we all see the same thing? That's sort of certain one approach, and you could argue that reality is shared. Uh, some people live in slightly altered realities for me, and I don't totally understand it. But, um, but generally speaking, we, we share the same physics. But, but what happens if we can divide and certain people get to see certain views of reality and certain people others? How do we handle that? All these rules have to get worked out. and We don't uh, really know the answers yet. These are some things that will evolve with a lot of different approaches. Finally, the last thing I'll, I'll um, uh, leave you with there is uh, on privacy. So it's a big issue for me. I just wrote an article about the coming wave of eye-tracked devices, uh, VR goggles and glasses that all have eye tracking in them. And, and there are also other issues related to privacy with AR. And some of them are indoor issues. Some of them are about, do I really want to show my space, what's my house, my private areas? Uh, and others are, what about when we take pictures of people without their consent? And it's happening all the time. If I hold up my phone, how do we handle all this flow of data that might be flowing up to people's various clouds? Is it is it stripped? Is it shared? And um, the panelists have some thoughts on how to take care of that as well. All right, so that's about all I'm going to uh, do for now. I'm going to start with Matt's slide. Uh, Matt, you're going to introduce yourself. And we have the slide that you provided behind you. And you can't see it, but you wrote it, so hopefully you remember. Yeah, oh, uh, if you need to see it, come, yeah. on, come on up to the podium. And um, we'll go through everybody, and we'll, we'll uh, then take off the, with the questions right after. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Matt, I'm the founder of 6D.ai. Um, we're a company that's building uh, APIs to help you know, phones and devices understand the world in 3D. 
So really we are solving some of the hardest technology problems and working with like large developers to um, you know, build spatial applications. So we're um, you know, still a small company. We've raised you know, about five and a half million. We're about 15 or 16 people. And probably one of the unique things about us is that we're a spin out of a research lab at Oxford University that was one of the, the best sort of AR computer vision research groups in the world. So we have, you know, for a small team, an incredibly deep, you know, technical bench and we're, you know, independent in, from all the big platforms. So that's our, you know, that's our kind of position in the market. So. That's great. Anj, you're up. Hi, everybody. I'm Anjane. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ubiquity6. It's super fun to be on this stage because my first freshman class as a Stanford undergrad here was in this hall. It was IHUM, Introduction to Humanities, which is a mandatory class on campus, and it's humans and machines. You have fond memories. I do have fond yes. memories. Mm. <laughs> uh, it was the first class that introduced me to the concept of, of um, 3D representations of the real world. It was Jeremy Balenson, who runs the Virtual Human Interaction Lab here. Um, in the same class, I met my now co-founder and CTO, Ankit, uh, who we ended up being roommates. Um, he ended up joining a company called Metamind that came out of the computer vision uh, lab not too far from here at Gates. And two years ago, um, we decided to start Ubiquity 6. And our goal really is to turn the camera from just a capture device into um, a device that brings people together face-to-face -to -face for real-time experiences. I think we were all promised that these phones were supposed to bring us all closer to each other. Um, I know that freshman year when I showed up here, around the time Snapchat was just taking off because Evan was sending it out to our dorm list, um, it, it, it was clear that the, 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 the camera had found itself inserted in, in a way that was making us all look down more and share more with people who weren't around us. But if you walked into any of the dining halls here, you'd see that that was taking its toll on the social experiences around us. So our goal is to build stuff that brings people together in the physical spaces you care about, whether that's this hall or a dorm room. We raised uh, $37.5 million um, from some great folks, and we're 60 people across SF, Toronto, and New York. We're hiring. So um, we're hiring across the board. One of the things we, we care about a lot is making sure that all the hard problems that Matt and Avi described um, are have the chance to be exp exp exposed to consumers in really creative ways. So we have people working on computer vision, but also on, on design and creative experiences. Uh, and, and in that sense, we, we do have a studio team that, that exposes that technology to consumers directly. So we're looking for, for talented people across the board to join. Excellent. Okay, Rachel. Um, so I'm a designer, so all of my slides are pretty pictures. <laughs> um, uh, so Avi wanted me to kind of give a little bit of a background of, of where I'm coming from. Uh, so I've been at Google for about five years, um, and everything that I've worked on at Google has had some relationship to the map uh, or to imagery. And so I started off uh, working on uh, Project Sunroof, which kind of combined uh, Earth imagery with other data sets like uh, weather and sunlight to help you understand how you can kind of accurately uh, estimate uh, your solar potential. Um, and then moving on to Google Earth, um, which Avi worked on kind of the original version. So I think uh, whatever version you worked on uh, ended up inspiring me to work on this project. Um, so uh, we kind of took on redesigning Google Earth um, for web and, uh, and for mobile. Um, that was just like a dream come true of a project. Um, and as I was working on Google Earth, there was um, kind of this uh, whispers of, of something happening in the space of like maps plus AR potentially. Um, and uh, I got involved just kind of on the side working on it, um, but eventually um, was like part of the original team to, to pitch that to our, our geo leadership and uh, getting that kind of out the door has been um, really exciting. Um, I didn't expect, I was telling Avi that I didn't expect to be working in AR. I was actually a pretty uh, big skeptic uh, when they first approached me to, um, to help with the pitch. Uh, but I'm, a, I'm an AR convert, I guess. Um, and it, I find it really inspiring to think about how we might reveal or kind of make people maybe more curious about the world around them, the actual world around them. 
and, and that's out now. That if you have a Pixel phone, you can yeah. use high-end features now. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry, I didn't like ask you to advance the slides. So yeah. yeah, thought about you know user needs when you're out and about, and and kind of the the first uh, use case that we wanted to tackle was a use case that we're probably all familiar with of just like being disoriented in a new city. You know, come out of a subway, don't know which way to go first. Um, so yeah, we have um, what you see on the next slide um, out for uh, local guides um, and now Pixel users. Um, which is AR walking navigation. So kind of reducing the abstraction of the map, um, no more guesswork, uh, just kind of telling you exactly where to go in those moments where you're confused. Very cool. Anything else you want to say? No? OK, Peter. OK. Um, Thank you for, for updating the slide, too. It looks much better than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I just found out yesterday that uh, a slide was required. Um, so uh, my name is Peter uh, Rojas. I'm a partner at BetaWorks Ventures. Uh, we're a pre-seed and seed based fund, uh, focus fund based in uh, San Francisco and New York. Uh, and um, we really focus on emerging consumer behaviors uh, powered by frontier technologies and interfaces. Um, really uh, interested and curious in um, the moment when the user meets the interface. Uh, and. Uh, uh, new forms of uh, new uh, startups are building new kinds of experiences which feel native to uh, new platforms and interfaces. And, and so that's what we get really excited about. And we love um, being as far out there as we can get away with, uh, with uh, uh, new, mainly consumer uh, focused um, startups or um, companies which are building uh, tools for uh, enabling consumer focused uh, experiences and, and products and services. Uh, and by the way, how many startup founders in the audience are there? OK, cool. OK, so it was worth the trip. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for coming, no matter yeah. what. Um, OK, so we're going to go one more. And um, I would be remiss if I did not remind you that you can ask questions, too. Uh, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, you see some hashtags. If you go and uh, tweet, I think either one of those hashtags is going to wind up showing up eventually uh, on my tablet here. Uh, and I'll, I will do my best to ask your questions, uh, given the time that we have. Um, was there anything else I was supposed to say before we go? Got it? OK. Hmm? Oh, and they can text, too. Right. There's a, there, there is a texting number as well. Um, OK. So uh, we'll leave it on that slide. And uh, we're going we're gonna to hopefully jump into some interesting questions. And um, everybody I know uh, pretty well is super nice. But we're also, feel free to tell us why your startup or why your project is special and, 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 and better than the others. That's actually perfectly fine <laughs> okay. to. Uh, yeah. To, uh, to, to show, your, show, show your value here. Um, so one of the questions that I think a lot of people are going to be interested in is um, the funding story today. So sorry, uh, Rachel, this one, you won't have to worry about that so much. No worries. Your company is, is pretty well funded at this point. Um, <laughs> uh, but not, it wasn't forever, and, and, and they had a story too. But I think uh, it would be interesting to hear about uh, a little bit more about um, the current state of your company, you talked a bit about your current funding, but more so, not just by the numbers, but uh, I know you've, you've written a lot about your story and how you got excited about this. And uh, Matt, I know you, you know, for a number of years now, and um, it, you know, I think today people are throwing offers at you, but that wasn't the case no. <laughs> uh, six years ago, when I think when I first yeah. met you, uh, your startup was a bit struggling. So maybe you can talk about um, the road to get here yeah. Uh, and where we are now, and, and, and that'll kick things off, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been uh, like coming on 10 years now for me in AR. Uh, I joined uh, a startup in Amsterdam and helped them raise some money, and then came to San Francisco and started my own company that, you know, we, we struggled. Like, we were basically never had more than about six months of runway, and we were just constantly trying to, to stay afloat. And then um, I went and sort of did an internal startup inside Samsung and then came out and eventually started this company. And the, um, I guess what, what was interesting is we've been pretty much working on the same problem the whole time. Um, you know, I've, I don't think, you know, I'm working any less hard or I've gotten smarter or dumber in that time. But what definitely has changed is the market. And I've really learned as a, as a founder to really pay attention to the market and where, you know, I've been through, I think, three hype cycles now around AR and seen mm -hmm. everyone get excited and then it dies off inside. So I'm kind of immune to that. I don't, I don't think I'm clever when things are going well or, or dumb when things are going bad. But um, so how that's shaping, you know, our approach, you know, when I started um, 6D was we could have raised money, you know, straight away. But um, 
you know, Victor and I pretty much worked, just the two of us, you know, nights and weekends, or more than that, like probably 50, 60% of our time, um, until we got to the point that we didn't really need seed money, and then we, we went out to raise it. And at that point, it just came together, like, really fast, because we'd achieved more than, you know, than we, we would have if we had tried to raise at the beginning. And, um, and it's, you're saying, we were about to, you know, go and raise some more money, and it's the same sort of approach. We've, we've probably waited longer than we could have um, because we've, you know, because I've seen this story and the hype up and down and, and been very quite conservative in, in sort of the expectations around how long this market's going to take to emerge, how long it's going to take for, you know, consumer glasses to arrive and then boom. So, yeah, you know. So this, been... this, is, this is the time. Like the last company I worked with you, Deco, um, we were hopeful. Yeah, but it wasn't. It didn't happen. It was too well, early. Even even today, like I, I would say, it's it's too early for most of AR today. But there's there's some particular niches like we are very much focused on um, enterprise, you know, big companies with you know difficult problems to solve, but clear benefit to their business, and really deep technical problems. And we're, we're sort of right at the intersection of that, and, that, and that's a, a great place to be today. Um, but you know, there are, there are other types of, of AR things, like if I was trying to build something on headsets that was some, like, entertainment product that I want, I needed, like, 10 million people to use, like, that's not going to happen next year. So I, I wouldn't do that. You know. Ange, is it, is it the right time? I, I think so. <laughs> but I think what, what Matt is describing is correct. These hype cycles, I'm sorry, Peter, to throw you under the bus, but basically I think VCs are schizophrenic, right? And, and I get to say that because I was one. Um, before I started this company, I was an investor at this firm called Kleiner Perkins. Um, Anybody heard of them? That they're, they're small, right, small right. Uh, boutique. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, did, did my time there as a schizophrenic where I realized investors are constantly saying, oh, they want to invest in the future in all these bleeding edge technologies like AR, VR, computer, you know, self-driving cars and so on. And then as a founder, you work so hard to show them the beginning, you know, the, 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 the first signs of that. And then the list of questions that start coming, but how will you, what about monetization? And what about product market fit? And what about this thing and that thing and this thing? And then before you know it, you're, you're going, well, I thought you were the ones who were supposed to be filling in the blanks, right? And helping us get to our vision. And I, I think what is helping this time around is that investors are A, not having to fill in a lot of the blanks themselves because there are, there are glimpses of AR in production at scale. And I know you said Pokemon Go is one of them. Snapchat Lens is a huge one. Yep. Right, and every day people are using Slam on a smartphone that they already own, and that and that wasn't a thing five years ago. Uh, so, so I think one those those um, that schizophrenic tendency to want to say you want to invest in the future, but then have to fill in the blanks at the same moment in time to get conviction, uh, is 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 um, that that gap is is narrowing, and then something I think I was able to. I think one, one thing I learned sitting on the other side of the table was as a founder, when you're approaching fundraising, you just have the, 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 like, the way to Jedi mind trick yourself is, is to basically say there's no such thing as an AR market. That doesn't exist yet. Yep. So instead, you have to be in the business of communicating what value proposition the AR creates for your consumers and then somehow figure out how to communicate that to investors, whether that's a prototype. Mm -hmm. It might be a short movie like you know, hyper reality. Yep. But you need something that is viscerally communicative about why this is not AR or VR or some other term du jour. There's an experience that's so killer to a consumer that the investor goes, how much do you need? And I think that was really hard to do, A, when some of these experiences weren't in production at scale. And, and two, when I think a lot of us as founders were still trying to convince investors that there was a thing called an AR or VR market. And I think a lot of us have gotten smarter about just going straight to the experience and showing off the demos of the prototypes on day one. So I'd love to jump into the experiences next, but did you want to respond to any of that, Peter? Um, well, I, I will agree with a lot of that because I think um, most investors are idiots, um, <laughs> frankly. Uh, you know, I, I will say that most VCs uh, have no idea what they're doing uh, and uh, often just get very lucky uh, and don't take the time to really understand the categories that they're investing in. Uh, and what happens is they hear about something, it's hot, uh, there's a lot of hype around it. And there's a window that you can get into as a founder when um, the category is new enough, mm. nobody knows exactly where it's gonna go. So investors will cut a check, in part not to miss out in case something does go happen, but also to get a little bit more understanding of how the market is shaping up. Mm. And um, you can miss that window. 
and then the questions get a lot harder because uh, the hype has died down, and then the investors who, um, again, don't really understand the market that well or the category that well, um, start to need to see more traditional, uh, you know, broader-based questions that are not just category-specific, but just you know, uh, generic to any investment that they're going to make, right? Whether it's enterprise or consumer, uh, and so um, you know, I think one of the things that you know that we pride ourselves at BetaWorks is that we go deep. We try to understand the categories really, really well. And then, um, you know, we don't invest, if something isn't working, like we're not gonna just plow cash into it, you know, just for the sake of not admitting that we were wrong, right? Um, but, you know, we also, uh, you know, take a really long view on how these markets develop. And I've been through a lot of cycles, not just as uh, an investor, but before that as a four-time founder, and then before that as a blogger and a journalist. Um, and I've seen how new consumer categories uh, new, new, new technology categories take a long time to mature. Mobile took a long time, a long time to get from, you know, the very early days of the smartphone to not just where we are today, but even just to the iPhone. It took years and years and years. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people were wrong about how the market was going to shape up. Um, and so I think, um, you know, as an investor, again, we try to go, uh, you know, try to keep our ears to the ground, try to understand where things are going. And then, you know, keep an eye out for what we think are these truly groundbreaking experiences which are being built. You know, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I totally share all those frustrations about, you know, investors because, you know, we'll invest in stuff and then, you know, we're, we're, we work hand in hand with our founders to try to get them to raise, you know, whether it's pre-seed to seed or seed to series A. And, um, or Series A to Series B, but we only do initial investments at pre-seed and seed. And I can see sometimes how those Series A investors just lack the you know, conviction and imagination around where these categories are going. Okay, that's good. I think, um, and, and what um, uh, VCs and CEOs might call product market fit, I might also call customer value, right? What, what, is, what is the reason that I'm gonna, for today, take my phone out of my pocket, hold it up, and, and hopefully walk around and, and not get hit by a car, right? What, what, what's the, what's the, the driving impetus? And I think, Rachel, this is a great place for, for you to jump in. And you have a use case. Like, you, you have all this great data, first of all. You have Google Earth, you have maps, you've, you've sent cars around the world, not you personally, but, but, uh, but, but you have it, and now you're using it to help us with uh, walking, with walking yeah. navigation. So tell us a little bit about how uh, your team uh, was able to sell that idea and say we should do this and some of the unique design considerations starting in a big company as opposed to a startup to, to yeah. launch something like this. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, myself, my team, we approach this like we would approach any design problem, which is looking for that user need. Um, so literally what I did was I looked through the massive research archive that we have um, and looked for, you know, where, where are these moments that we have identified where the 2D UI just isn't cutting it? Um, and, you know, knowing the strengths of AR, you know, knowing that it's really good at convincing, convincingly putting something in the world, reducing abstract uh, where, where is kind of that convergence of like a user need that already exists that we, you know, the 2D UI might not ever be that great at, at solving um, and what AR is really good at to then kind of come to, you know, conclusions about walking navigation, which, I mean, like I was saying earlier, we, I think that's, a, that's something where, you know, you can cl clearly see how folks are, are struggling to like uh, translate what they're seeing in the real world uh, with what they're seeing on the 2D map. Um, and we actually found through through user research that a, a lot more people than we expected struggle with map abstraction, which was, I, I mean, I it, it, it's also context dependent. Like you're traveling, you know, uh, I can be really comfortable navigating in San Francisco, but you know, travel abroad and I do need to be reliant on that map. Um, so I think it was kind of pinpointing those moments where uh, folks, you know, they, they really want to uh, know which way to go quickly and not have to deal with that kind of frustrating translation. Um, but, but yeah, I guess at the end of the day, my perspective, uh, especially coming from, from kind of the uh, AR skepticism in the beginning was just like, well, I'm just gonna approach this like I approach any design problem, starting, starting with the user need. Um, and not kind of being so enamored with the technology that you like lose sight of that. Great. So, so I think one of the problems that you're talking about is, is maybe an interesting one to dig into for a second, which is, um, just think about this for a second, and maybe we can do a show of hands. I think I'm, it'll be roughly split. Uh, those of you who use maps, um, raise your hand if 
you can imagine the space kind of in 2D or 3D, but you picture yourself on the map and you can sort of know, okay, I know this is over here, I know that's over there. So just if you're able to sort of conceptually do that, raise your hand, okay? And for those of you who can't, the other, the other mode of thinking is uh, perfectly normal also, um, which is uh, you may navigate by landmarks. I know which way to turn. I know when I go to this hallway, I turn left, and that's how I get to where I'm going. And it doesn't build a spatial map, but you still know where you're going. You still know the sequence of places to go. And we found that early on in mm -hmm. Google Earth that the, it was roughly split half and half. So now, even someone like me who can see in 3D and rotate things in my mind, I still go out the front door and I'm like, which way do I go? I have a map, I don't even know which way, you do this, right? Which way is it pointing? And um, that's one of the things that the camera promises to help is you go outside, takes a picture, and by sending that picture up to a cloud service or locally on the phone, now, you, now the system knows, okay, I'm, I am facing north, so we can immediately tell you to go left uh, to get to where you want to go. Is that, is that a good enough summary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so basically, just like the, the simplest way to explain it is, you know, we, we have Street View uh, in many places across the world, and, and what, what's happening is when you hold up your phone for that moment, um, the, the camera is cross-referencing what, uh, you know, it's seeing uh, with what it knows from, from nearby Street View panos. And, and that kind of solves this problem that, that you've also probably experienced today of like your, your blue dot on your map jumping around a bunch, uh, in, especially in dense urban areas. But if we can know kind of exactly uh, which street view panel you're looking at, then that can give us really precise uh, orientation and position, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it is a useful feature, and I think something people will take their their phone out of their pocket. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but to your point, it ha I mean, it has to be instant. We can't expect people to, you know, be, be holding their phones up for, you know, even even more than a few seconds. Um, they really just want to like get that answer and be on their way. And and, and I don't want to keep them in AR for, for longer than than they need to be in AR. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because they, we know that they won't walk around with their phone, even even if they have a map. It's still, you know, not a device that's ideal for uh, for putting things out in, in the world yet. Um, so, so building on that, um, on a slightly different angle, uh, so, so um, Matt especially, Manoj, if, if this is interesting to you. So Google's starting with a treasure trove of data, right? They've been driving cars around uh, for quite a while and have the street view data, which is very valuable data. It wasn't cheap to, to, uh, to, to collect. They had to pay people to drive these cars around. It was very expensive. Um, and they, I'm thinking they spent billions of dollars at this point easily on the data collection. Um, so you guys don't have that data. Even there's APIs, you can pay for it if you want to subscribe to it. Uh, but you're taking the more of the, the crowdsource approach. You're saying everybody, when they take out their phone, we're going to collect this data and, and build up a map over time. So can can you become the next Google by having everybody out there collecting this yeah, data? Yeah, sure. That's exactly <laughs> what we're doing. It's probably yeah, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, that, that approach, I mean, that was a conscious decision that we took in that... Um, you know, street view data is great if you're, you know, if you're in on the street. Um, but most people, you know, are either indoors or in shops or in, in places cars don't go. Um, and in those cases, like the only way to get a 3D model of that space is to either get some special hardware, which you know consumers don't really have, like to, to take some 3D scan, or to take like a thousand photos of the space and send it off and wait a day or an hour or something and get a get a model back and then say, well, what do I what do I do with this model? And um, one of the, you know, one of the, I guess, technical breakthroughs from our, our Oxford um, research group was that we can take a regular phone and, you know, with no special hardware and then build in, in real time a 3D model of the space. And, you know, an application can be running at the same time as that happens. So it means that from an application um, developer's point of view, there'd always been this chicken and egg problem. It's like, okay, I want to build an app that can work in this 3D space, but I really need a model of the 3D space, and I'm not going to get a model of the space until there's an app to make use of the model, so you know, nothing happened. Where you know, what we enable is that you can um, you know, build the app on the expectation that that model will appear as that app runs. And then the first time that happens, it, it sort of builds as you go, but then we save that, and the next time someone comes by and sort of overlaps a little bit with what you've done, it starts stitching together. And you end up with you know, a, a world scale map that is um, usable for these AR applications. And so that, you know, that was 
you know, I guess a, a sort of product or UX problem that you know, I'd been wrestling with for you know, the last 10 years or so. And then when I met, uh, met Victor, my co-founder, and he said, hey, I've got this cool tech, what should we do it for? I realized there's a, you know, there's a potential solution for um, you know, a, big, a big segment of how you know, these AR apps are going to um, be used. And you know, our, our tech isn't that great if you put it in a car and drive down the, the freeway at uh, you know, 60 miles an hour. But for pedestrian speeds and the sort of motion that we normally do and, and just mass market commodity hardware, we can enable all the stuff that maybe a you know, Magic Leap or HoloLens or some sort of special device today is needed for, we can do that on regular phones. So, so, yeah. so Anj, you, your, your tech can do similar things, but my sense is that you're more concerned, though, with making sure people have a good experience, multi-user experience, so you can take the phone out and play a game or do something together. Right. right. Is that right? I, I think in your keynote, you said, look, you need something interesting for people to pull out their phones and look at the world for. And I think we spend the bulk of our time thinking through what is that interesting thing, then work backwards. What is the minimum viable computer vision we need to deliver on that experience? Because you're, you know, when you guys were working on Street View uh, and on Google Earth, you didn't have 900 million phones out there in the world capable of really fast slam. And, and now we do. And so I think if you start with that vision in 2017, which we did, you have that option of, of, of building a user-generated model of the world. And, and our, our belief is, and I know we saw this with Pokemon Go, is, uh, at least for, for a while, was that if you give people that interesting reason, they're not doing it because it's AR, and they're not doing it because um, they want to be bleeding edge adopters or anything. The, most people are doing it because there's something they want in their camera feed that they cannot get without pointing their camera at the world for you. Mm -hmm. So that's what we, I think what we're working with is, is this incredible sensor fleet that all of you have in your pocket. And, and we're just waiting to, to do something with. Uh, and it, it feels like in 2011 when, when Kevin and, and Mike launched Instagram after the front facing camera had just you know, gone on the iPhone 3G and people had gone out and spent 800 bucks on this thing and were like, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And so that pent up demand and getting in front of the parade um, is, is kind of what is, is our belief right now. And so yes, we, we, I do think we, our approach is we don't need cars driving around the world if we can give people a really compelling reason to just to point their cameras at the world. And, 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 I, and I, I think what we're learning is that the camera is inherently a, a user-generated content creation tool. People use it to capture their daily lives. And so you, already, you have a natural human behavior with massive scale, just waiting to be pointed in the right direction. Okay. So we have, interestingly, we wound up with three completely different takes on this similar problem. We have, Rachel has, has almost has the entire world in her back pocket. Uh, ready to go, and she can use it to build interesting applications. And, and Matt is trying to very cheaply collect it uh, and build applications that use the scale of the world. And you're saying, start with the experiences, because we need, we need those great experiences for people to have a reason right. to take their phone out in the first place and collect it. Uh, and I think all three are right, but they're different. They're different approaches. There's one, there's one other factor, too, that I think is you know, uh, different to Arjuna's. And it's, you know, I definitely agree that having uh, a re you know, uh, an interesting reason, but there's another reason people do it is they're paid to do it and it's their job and mm -hmm. there's a lot that you know uh, giving your phone a, a sort of spatial understanding of, of the you know the place it's in and the sort of data that's available in that space um, you know can make people's jobs easier or more profitable or faster or less training and mm -hmm. uh, that's another way that I think a lot of this these experiences are going to come to market and the way a lot of the data is going to be captured. Uh, one thing I just add is it's, it's easy to forget that this the, this domain space of mapping the world from images and then reconstructing depth actually got started from for, to solve a UGC problem, right? The original Snavely paper from Microsoft Research, wherever it was, was about <coughs> constructing models of popular tourist locations <laughs> from crowdsourced data sets of photos. And so that application and that need is is actually what got this what got this started. And if you remember the uh, there were these, uh, in, in the 2008 election when Obama was delivering his commencement, uh, his inauguration speech, you could actually, you know, they, they were able to reconstruct an entire 3D model of, of the inauguration and you were able to switch, swap different viewpoints mm -hmm. in the crowd. Um, and that was a really cool application. We've had that need for a while and people, um, that, that application got, it was a WebGL little viewer, but you know, it got six million use, uses. It was super cool. You could yeah. zoom all the way in and out. Um, very cool. Um, so, so Rachel, you have this first application that you've launched, which is uh, useful, 
right? It's very useful to be able to figure out where you are, where you're going. What are, um, what are some things, uh, you probably can't tell me about what's next and you haven't announced yet. I know how it works in big companies. But what are some things that you would want to do today but can't yet? You think would be great user experiences, but it's just not, we're not there yet. Like even with Google's massive resources and the great designers, we still can't do it. Yeah, uh, I think that one thing I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately is, um, is kind of how to make people a little bit more curious and aware of their real world surroundings. Um, so like rather than like putting extra information on top of it, like what can AR unlock um, in terms of experiences that can uh, kind of spark that wonder and curiosity that kind of to your point earlier, I feel like we are like disconnected from uh, right now. You know, we're all like kind of staring down, um, but perhaps like uh, looking up and, and inspiring people through what we're revealing um, um, like that, that is personally interest, really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, Peter, what do you think are, right now, you know, I'm sure you talk to hundreds of companies and get lots of pitches. Um, some of them are realistic. Some of them probably are like, what do you, what do you want, crack? Uh, like the, I wish I saw more of the crack ones. You want more crack? <laughs> uh, so um, what do you think are the biggest uh, opportunities right now in this space that maybe aren't being pursued here, but, but you either hope to see or, or are looking for? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I always put the caveat that if I had a really strong sense of what that, I would probably do it myself, um, which I think, you know, uh, we saw someone who, who went from being a, an investor to uh, being a founder because he saw an opportunity uh, in the category. Both. Him too. Oh, by both of you, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll put that caveat out there that I don't necessarily like have the answers. I'm, I'm You're looking to start a company, as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I want to put myself through that again. Um, but uh, but you know, the the thing that I'll say is that um, there are a lot of I get pitched a lot of really obvious people think obvious things like oh, wouldn't it be great to post uh, photos at a location and you open up your phone and you can see photos posted or notes or things like that? Um, that is probably not a startup opportunity. <laughs> Uh, at this point or, or probably ever. Uh, so, but you get a lot of that stuff. Uh, a lot of, um, we're gonna do a blockchain-based uh, AR property, you know, I get, I've probably seen that 10 times in the past year. Uh, and uh, I don't think that's ever gonna, that's gonna work uh, either. I don't think that anybody cares about that. Because blockchain solves everything, right? <laughs> I'm a contrarian in that I think it's all bullshit, but um, you know, uh, um, so don't yeah, pitch me. That's popular opinion. <laughs> oh, maybe it, it, well, I was I was against it before. It was cool to be against it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a blockchain hipster. Yeah, um, I've always been contrarian uh, against it. Uh, but um, I think the, the the things that I'm interested in is um, is that there are big kind of themes around, um, especially around consumer, which is. Uh, there's, we want to play, right? I think we want to um, express ourselves and we want to communicate. And I think that um, there are going to be opportunities in those three broad categories. Uh, and I think the challenge for startups is a lot of the things you have to do is um, you have to find ways, novel ways that take advantage of the fact that you have this now spatial dimension to the experience. If, and, and I think if you look historically at computing, um, we have this thing where every time we have a paradigm shift, um, and Matt has probably heard me talk about this a million times now, um, but we port the design and user interface paradigms of the old you know, interface into the new one, uh, and it sucks. And then when people figure out how to design natively for that new interface, people come up with really cool stuff. And we saw this with the transition from you know, microcomputing to PC, PC to mobile, and now sort of P, you know, mobile to I mean, there's now a fragmentation of different post, you know, mobile interfaces, but um, uh, AR is one of them, right? And I think that one of the, the things that I find most uh, frustrating is people building what feel like basically just mobile experiences um, that are just kind of like pushed out there into a tabletop. Yeah. And that is not interesting at all. Mm. Um, you know, even location-based photography, like photo sharing, is better without AR, frankly, because you can just look at the photo on your phone. Um, you know, having to like get up to it uh, is, you know, actually a worse experience from a, a user standpoint. And so, um, you know, what really interests me is, is uh, startups that are going to take real risks around the interface and experiment and find those new things. And so that's what I'm looking for as an investor. Uh, you know, I think uh, a, a, a lot of founders, and I don't blame them, are playing it kind of safe with a lot of this stuff because they don't want to fail. 
But, um, and most people who do these experiments are going to fail. But I want to find the one in 100 or one in 1,000 that are taking that big risk and finding something really interesting and cool and new, just in the way that Instagram did, uh, with, which was rethinking you know, photography for the smartphone era, the connected device era. The, the, o the only caveat I would add to that is that it, it, it catches a lot of founders, I think, by surprise how much more expensive 3D is to iterate and be risky in than 2D. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that needs capital often. So I think there's often a correlation between playing it safe and access to capital prior to you getting buy-in. I mean, I think that's definitely, I think that is part of it. But I also think that um, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that I see being built, uh, whether it's you know, well-funded or not, mm, could is, be is still, more innovative. could be more, I, I, I would like to see more risk-taking, mm. sure. And it's, fun, it's a function of time. If you go back again to even the early, you know, iPhone era, most of the apps were not that interesting or exciting. It took a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you have to sort of be patient and have like a longer time horizon around this stuff. So today we have phones. Uh, we hold these up. How much are you all thinking about the future of possibilities of devices? Uh, we have a few examples out there today that you can play with. You have you have um, uh, Magic Leap, you have HoloLens. I wouldn't exactly call them quite ready to be worn around. Uh, out in everyday uh, existence, but uh, how much are you thinking, today we need to figure out how to take advantage of billion phones that are out there ready to go with great technology in the phones versus, boy, if we just had this new technology that's not there yet, then we take off. Then we can do new, new user experiences, uh, things that we can't do today on the phone. Yeah, we, I mean, we think about it all the time, um, but we not, no, no one's asking for it. Like None of our customers are asking for, it or for any of this stuff. So. Every, every sort of customer that we work with wants basically an app that they can push out to the phone and, and they're really interested in finding particular problems that you know, giving the phone a spatial awareness can solve. You know, and it usually isn't like a, a dancing stormtrooper in, in your living room. It's, it's sort of much more about getting useful data or useful information from a, from a space. Mm -hmm. um, the companies that are most interested in working with us on headset type you know, projects are the headset companies uh, because they're looking for ways to bridge their developer community, which, you know, has got thousands of devices on the headset out to, you know, hundreds of millions of devices and, and build something that's, that's pretty consistent from a software point of view, even though, you know, one user experience is like this and the other one's, you know, like this. So, um, so yeah, you know, we, we think about it a lot, but we're not seeing a lot of demand in the market beyond the, the headset companies themselves. Yeah, I would think without the hardware, there's going to be no demand. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious as to the things that you really want to do, are, are you going to have to wait? Are you going to have to wait for that hardware? Or are there no, saying no. today there's today, enough to no, do, no, today good to go? Oh, there's there's the so much for us to do today. Like there's, the, the thing is you need to think, like, like to Peter's saying, what are the types of experiences that work mm -hmm. today, that are, that are AR and native on a phone today? And... Um, you know, to be honest, I don't think there's enough designers you know, thinking about this space yeah. today. There's, there's more than there was when, when I got started. But it, it takes that design thinking to say, look, this um, you know, first player shooter in AR game isn't really going to work on a phone. Um, that you've got to wait for. But mm -hmm. something that says, look, give me, a, give me a 3D model of this room and give me all the dimensions and floor plan automatically, that can be done easily on a phone today. So. It's, it really starts to become a design problem and, and choosing the, the use case. Let me, let me jump over to Rachel then. <laughs> so uh, your team put out something interesting along with the Maps navigation. I don't know if you, if you shipped it. Tell me if, if you did. But it was this fox that you, would, that you would put on the street. And the fox would walk around, I guess, and you would follow it, I guess was the idea. And to, to Peter's point about new interfaces, that's new. To me, that's not something that we're, we're, we're used to seeing. It wouldn't make a lot of sense in 2D on a phone, but in 3D you could imagine, okay, it's like follow the white rabbit. It's kind of like, that's gonna lead me somewhere. And uh, is it something now that you've shipped? Is it, did you test it? Was it interesting? Uh, so yeah, the, the, the Fox, uh, so for context, uh, last year at IO, we showed air walking navigation, but we also showed this very adorable uh, Fox. Um, and that, that was one of uh, many, I think the count was up to like, 
over 120 prototype variants that we tested of uh, the, the AR walking navigation experience. Uh, and, and to your point, uh, like Peter and Matt, you know, I think it is a, a design and prototyping problem. It's, it's, it, you know, we wouldn't have come to the conclusion that we came to um, had we not done uh, all of those prototypes and kind of gone into it with the mindset that like, you know, this is a totally new area of interaction design. Uh, you know, there's no design spec that I can pull up or my team can pull up to understand how to design for outdoor world scale AR, so it's necessary for us to, to have this prototyping mindset and uncover those best practices along the way. Um, the Fox is interesting. Um, so 25 out of those 120 plus uh, prototype variants were of the Fox experience specifically. Um, and uh, you know, we put it in front of users and we found that people had really high expectations for how that, that Fox would behave. Um, people expected her to uh, avoid poles and fire hydrants. Um, they expected her to know like all shortcuts. Um, and some people expected her to know or want to some people expected her to lead them to interesting things to do in the city. Um, so they were, had really high expectations of this AR character. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, they were really enamored by her because our designers had done a wonderful job creating a very adorable animal. Um, but that meant that the, you know, users had all these expectations of this AR character to you know, have them do different things. Um, and that made the design problem even more complex. Um, so we haven't quite cracked the, the Fox experience yet, um, but we're continuing to prototype it because we're really excited about it. But um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't quite solved that. So we'll continue. Maybe we'll need to do like another 100 uh, prototypes, which we've kind of accepted at this point. Like I just kind of expect that most of what I design is not going to work because um, we're, we're uncovering like best practices together. Um, and it's only until we find what works uh, do we kind of share it with the world. Yeah. yeah. And is the nature of prototyping, uh, yep. which is a little different than startups. You want to you yeah, test absolutely. the box? Yeah. This is well, a good so example you'll, you'll of the like uh, the, the incentive at the end of the study was you got a stuffed fox. Oh, great. So, that's that's yeah. done it for that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> just, and just to give you a picture of this kind of user testing, we were talking about this before. Just it's very uh, imagine something out of Monty Python where you have a user and you have a gaggle of people walking behind that user, maybe seeing it's what they're seeing a, through yeah, their eyes. Two people. I, mean, I know it, I'm exaggerating, like but six. but it's still it, it's 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 just great to imagine that we're like all studying this person as they're walking around the world and seeing yeah. how they how they use the experience. I was telling Avi like this is working on this project. First of all, I walk way more than I did when I was working on, on Google Earth. My step count is way up. Um, and Because we can't, we can't do this type of research in a lab setting. Like The, the use case uh, means that we have to get out there, uh, be in San Francisco. And yeah, I think, I think people, uh, often, especially if we, we have kind of the, the glasses on, uh, think that like we are like handlers for the celebrity who is our participant. Um, yeah, especially if we have an umbrella. Then it's like, ooh, who's that? So if you see that on the street, now you know. Yeah going on. Just a user study. Um, okay, so, so uh, I have one category of questions to jump into that we haven't gotten into yet, uh, and that's privacy. And that it comes up a lot when we have these, these debates. Um, uh, I mentioned I just read an article about eye tracking. It's not really relevant to this, but there are very similar issues. Maybe more so indoors, we're talking about taking pictures inside of people's houses and uploading those to the cloud, but just as much outdoors, even other public spaces. Uh, and so uh, Matt, I know, for example, you have um, some interesting technology that can remove people from photographs. So you're, you're, the camera, before anything is uploaded to the cloud where you stitch things together, you're going and finding the edges of people and actually trying to, to yeah, take them out. Them, yeah. um, what other uh, privacy concerns? And then uh, on similar question, but do you, or do you upload things to the cloud? Do you have to worry about that or do everything locally on the device? Where it's yeah, we, up, we upload everything to the cloud. Okay. Um, and uh, my view on this is, and I'm interested to hear yours as well, is that unlike the last wave of consumer startups that were interacting through the world, to the, with the world through the camera, you, you just don't get a free pass anymore on privacy. So it was OK for Instagram and Snap and so on to, to basically say, we will get to privacy. Uh, and especially if you yell loud enough, we'll, we'll, we'll add it. But when we start, everything will be public. We're just, you know, we're new, we're innovative. Like we get the free pass for being a start. That that doesn't happen anymore. You're not the underdog anymore. Uh, and so our a, a big reason why I, I mentioned that this medium is more expensive is that expectations are pretty high across the board, both for UX as well as privacy. And that just means you got to build a lot more stuff, like permissions and controls and pretty fine-grained 
notification systems so that people don't feel like they feel in control and they do not feel violated. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, once you have spatial context about people's intimate spaces, that is a level of understanding we've never really had at scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we're basically a lot, more, you know, we're much, we're much uh, far further back on our roadmap than we would be if we didn't have to build privacy and permissions. But it, it's stable stakes for us. There have been a number of, of privacy mistakes over the years, not right. by you, but, but uh, other companies have proven that this is something you do have to take very seriously. Right. Uh, did you want to add anything else besides what I said? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. Like some of it is just, just good hygiene on you know, good passwords and things on your servers. And um, you know, one big aspect is don't capture data that you don't need to capture just in case you want to use it later. Like I know some of the big, big platforms have the attitude of just, we just want to get everything we can and then we'll figure out if it's useful you know, some years down the track. So things of, like that is just hygiene. Um, there's a bunch of um, you know, very explicit technical decisions we've made that, are, that have resulted in you know, having a much harder system to build. And it's based on you know, our belief that nothing, no image data, like no photos, no images should ever leave the phone. So if you're using your phone or a headset in your home or wherever, the only thing that leaves that phone should be you know, already post-processed and mm. just anonymized and be some machine-readable information. And so that you're not, you know, there's no chance for a, you know, th this camera that's constantly running to send something up to your carrier or, or a cloud provider and who knows you know, what happens once it, once it leaves your phone. So, like Avi said, we've, we've built technology to remove people that, so you actually never even get saved in the phone, like any images, photos on the wall of people. We've, um, you know, we don't do any of the processing in the cloud. So we don't sort of pass images up and then process where you are and process that 3D map and then give you the map back. What we do is just send a, a rough information up to the cloud. We send some you know, rough map data back down and then we process and do all that synchronization and all the all of the understanding of the space, all of that happens on the device and it, it never leaves the never leaves the device. So we're, we're gonna jump into the audience questions right now, but I want to make sure Rachel, you seem like you might want to say something. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just gonna um, wanted to talk about it from kind of the UX perspective. You know, part of the reason why we uh, kind of have this design principle of like short AR moments is because of, you know, we we don't we don't want the user to uh, be uncomfortable using this application. Um, and you know, they're gonna make that that cost benefit analysis of like like, you know, am I extremely lost right now and do I need to have this moment of AR? Um, you know, if, if I feel like I need it, then, you know, I have the agency to use it. Um, but that was kind of a, a shift o over the course of all of those prototypes to say, like, actually, we need to, we need to really advocate for these short moments um, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, privacy, user safety, um, but that was kind of an interesting shift that happened over the course of, um, of the, de the development of this experience. Yeah, it's good to know. All right, we're ready to move on. You well, I had one quick point. I think there's an adjacent issue here, which is um, that you know, sooner or later, there is going to be um, some sort of you know, social app or, or something even specifically designed for harassment where people are tagging um, you know, information about other people. I call it the Scarlet Letter app. Yeah. Mm. You can and, put and, an A on someone else's chest and they can't even see it. Yeah, exactly, and I think that it's gonna be, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember uh, there was an app called Third Voice about 20 years ago, which was you could put post-it notes on any website. It was like a browser mm. plugin type thing. Um, didn't go anywhere, actually descended basically into like profanity and spam really quickly. Um, but you can see when you add, when you take the ability to control um, the annotation around something uh, away from, um, you know, like once you take, like with websites, like once you take the ability to, uh, to control how other people view your site away from the publisher, um, you know, there can be misuses of it, right? Uh, and I think that we are gonna have this problem um, which goes way beyond the, you know, harassment that we're seeing on social platforms right now, which is already intolerable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the fact that like, you could start to drive around a city and somebody could be tagging the you know, private information, um, derogatory information about uh, a woman, you know, about women or um, you know, people of color uh, that they want you know, to target for harassment, I think is gonna be an, incredibly, you know, an incredible challenge. And I don't think it's gonna come from 
you know, the big platforms. It's going to come from, you know, basically uh, people playing around and building this stuff, taking tools that are already out there yeah. um, and, you know, cobbling things together really quickly. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. It's, a, it's going to be a, a really big issue. And, you know, even if the big companies set up their rules, there's going to be always some small company that comes along and doesn't need a lot of funding to come along and build that app that's really going uh, to... Hard, very hard to stop. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. Um, okay, so we have some interesting questions from the audience. We have a little bit of time, so we're going we're gonna to jump into those. And these are going to jump around a bit. Um, I am going to try to pick some of the ones that don't cover the stuff that we've already talked about first, uh, so that we, we cover as much ground as possible. Um, so uh, one of these is, um, you know, we talked about um, uh, blockchain, the other, the other buzzword is 5G. Uh, and 5G also solves everything somehow, miraculously. Yeah. Uh, and so do you think, five, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to prejudice the answer at all, but um, <laughs> do you think that 5G is going to make a difference uh, to overcome limitations of the phone connecting AR to the real world? Uh, no. I, I actually used to be a telecom engineer for 15 years before getting into AR and, and worked rolling out telecom networks. And I've seen this story, like it's the new network, it's going to solve everything, it's enable some use case. Uh, I don't really believe that 5G is going to do much apart from make the download speeds a bit faster. It's not going to, um, I mean, it will support more devices in, in, you know, in stadiums and things, but um, this promise of, oh, we can just process everything in the cloud now and throw all these GPUs at it because the latency is so short and the bandwidth is so fast, I, I just, that's not going to happen. And, it's going to need entire network build outs these, to get those speeds. You, you put your hand in front of it and it blocks the signal and things stop. So, I, um, yeah, I, I don't believe that hype. Anyone want to take the, uh, the opposing view on that? The only contrarian approach I'd take is like, there, Matt is absolutely right, in, especially in particular for the, for the experience and for the viability of the experience in the United States. Um, I grew up in Singapore. And the, there are a few exceptions to this where you have developed dense areas where you basically, the infrastructure is essentially regulated by a single party government. And when that happens, you can actually get a moment in time where you get a discrete upgrade. And sometimes that is, is actually meaningfully ubiquitous enough that you can start to take certain things for granted that you couldn't before. Um, 5G, is, the verdict is out. I, I'm with Matt on the skepticism in the US. But we're lucky enough that we've been able to do a few tests with some partners in, in some of these markets like Japan, Korea, and, and Singapore. And it, it is actually pretty promising when you're trying to get a lot of um, stuff off, off the user's device and, and when the, with the user's consent. Yeah. Now, that, that can't save you, right? It, but on the margins, it, it, does, it does help with engagement. So did you want to The only thing I'll add is I, I, I think that assuming that um, they can deliver on a lot of the uh, promises around lower latency, which does require a lot of, I think people don't realize that, I think to Matt's point, that the range of the, of the um, 5G nodes is very limited because mm -hmm. of the, um, at the higher, the bandwidth that it's at. Um, and so a lot of people are, are gonna be falling back to you know, slower network speeds and slower, lower latency, uh, higher latency. Um, but I think if you can get the latency um, low enough, it does promise an improvement in like multiplayer or multi-user experiences. Um, but I, I think the challenge, I think, if you're developing an application is, you know, you kind of have to build for the lowest common denominator around this stuff. Um, like if you're building a mobile game, you have to assume that um, if you're, it's multiplayer, that the latency is going to be terrible. Somebody's still running 3G or 2G. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it's, um, you know, designing for the optimal edge case is a way to really shrink your user base, uh, your addressable user base for a product. Um, and that's, it's related to, to another question on here, um, which I'll summarize. It's, it's a little long. Um, but in, in communal areas in many parts of the world, we don't have, you know, like I said, even 4G. Uh, you might be on 3 or 2. Uh, it's scattered. It's, it's, it's not the same everywhere. So how much... Uh, and there's all sorts of other issues that the question asks about things that we already see today before AR happens in terms of, in terms of uh, viruses and, and other threats that happen on these networks. But uh, how much of this, how much do you think about like that high end, the, the, the best case scenario versus what does everybody have today? Where, where, where's everybody thinking today and how can, we, how can we give everyone the best and protected experience today? Yeah, I mean, we, we are working hard on that. We're, um uh, you know, essentially in the last year we've just seen on the same hardware our software has, has gotten probably 10 times as fast and 
what used to be like a few frames per second on an iPhone X now runs fine on an iPhone 6. So, um, you know, the fact that A, we do everything on the device so you don't even need a network to get a, to get a good experience and we're, we're pushing this further down into the low-end devices, it's, it's, it's essential for our customers to be able to have successful businesses built on us. Okay, so we have another question about, um, the question wanted Peter more specifically to define uh, the long view that you talked about, how many years. But part B of this question uh, is why fund a startup when you can do this idea inside a big company? So let me, let me ask Rachel and Peter to talk about sort of the, why would you do this as a startup? Or is it, does it make sense to go join a big company uh, and have, uh, have a lot of resources and do it, incubate there where you get a lot of tools to prototype? And, and, and I've done both, and you're both good examples of, of, of both of that extreme. And so what, what, what's the advantage the startups have and, and how far out are many of these things? And Rachel, then jump in on your, um, your, your view. Well, I, can, I can actually speak to the second as well because I was a founder and then um, uh, ran experimental product development at a, a large-ish internet company. Um, and... Uh, um, I can say that your incentives as a founder are completely different <laughs> around uh, what you want to build, and, and uh, uh, certainly, you know, there's a temptation to save your good ideas. Um, and there, but there are th certain things that you can only do with the access to the scale and resources of a big company, right? So I, I think you have to. It, it tends to be kind of a case by case decision, and uh, based on individually what you want, and also, you know, I think Rachel can speak in more detail of that. I, I think the long view, um, you know, I mean, as an investor. Um, you know, I have to, uh, especially being a seed investor, I need to invest in a certain life cycle of a company, right? Early, um, you know, first, you know, fundraising event or second fundraising event, uh, usually for a, for a startup. Um, you know, you can be early to a market or you can be late to a market as an investor and, and um, getting that timing right is really hard. Um, and I think that also the long-term time horizon can vary category by category. I think that, um, you know, VR, for example, is taking is it took a long time just to get to the Quest, right? Which came out last month, um, and some people argue that really that's when VR started. It was you know on May twenty first when the Quest came out, um, and how many years you know has it been since uh, you know the first Rift? I think it was the Kickstarter for the first Rift or something like that. So um, it can take a long time. Um, you know, I think as an investor, we look at it as we want to make sure that we are investing not so early that the market is not going to develop in time and the companies are going to fail or fail to raise more financing, um, but not so late that those early opportunities are, are gone and it's tough to get into the, to the market. Um, but recognizing that for most startups, it's going to take um, you know, five to 10 years um, to get to some sort of success. And you know, we're okay with that. Um, and that's the, as, an, as a venture investor, we think about 10 year you know, horizon. Mm. Well, Rachel? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that you offer kind of, I mean, you've experienced both. I haven't been at a startup, so I can speak to kind of what I've found uh, in terms of working at Google. Um, I think interesting challenge, but also positive um, is, uh, you know, Within Google Maps, uh, uh, it's a long-standing you know, navigation and discovery application uh, that millions of people use across uh, across the globe, which is great on one one side of the coin. But on the other side of the coin, you know, you have these uh, these expectations and behaviors that um, people are just have a uh, a mental model about how they use Google Maps. And for uh, lots of folks, it's it's going to using AR walking navigation in Google Maps is going to be the first time they use any AR application, and so. So getting that first impression right is really important, um, and also uh, kind of meeting them where they are in terms of their expectations of this new technology. Um, and I think part of that has been, you know, being real, really realistic about what the 2D map is good at. You know, some things are just bad, you know, some things we can just do more efficiently and better on a, on a 2D map. Sometimes all you need is a 2D list view. You don't need to like see the same list view in AR. Um, and I think, you know, it's it, it's it's great that we are able to kind of uh, leverage like all that maps uh, gives us, um, but it also introduces some interesting challenges in terms of uh, working with existing expectations of this wide user base. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, 
That was, that was great. And, and uh, back to the thing we asked the audience about, people who navigate by list and, and actually really want to read through, I turn left here, I go, I go straight here. Uh, you have to cater to that half of the population who's, whose brain works that way versus the, the kind that spatialize. And it's a, it's a challenge. It's a very hard design problem to challenge for, to design for everybody um, consistently. OK, so um, we have a couple more minutes. We're going to pick uh, some different questions. Um, uh, this I think is is an easy one. Let me let me ask it, and I think I think I know what the answer is. But I'll just do you do you endorse hidden data streams, e.g., telemetry, uh, embedded in apps? Is that something that you would allow uh, as CEOs of your companies or companies that you might fund or Google that you could be collecting information that people might not be aware of? Will you do that? Not if not if the consumer is not not aware of it. Um, definitely could happen where they're. You know they're, they're made aware of it, and it happens you know in the background after that. But I actually think the hard part of that question is how do you uh, inform someone as to what this data actually means? You know, like if if we talk about sending slam data from a phone to the cloud, like that that's meaningless to people. So just a, a checkbox saying are you okay to send slam data doesn't say. You have it. to actually explain it, and it's, it's part of. Inform, yeah. informed consent, the emphasis is on the word informed. Yes. People have to understand before they can say being asked. yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the hard part. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, uh, same, ab yeah, absolutely not. Like, you, every, I'm with Matt, you just have to explain everything. You have to over communicate. Um, surprises are never good. So we don't, on our product, we don't collect anything without the user explicitly, in fact, on a session by session basis, choosing to share it with us. Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, I think even if um, you know you didn't have an ethical problem with it, I think just from a practical standpoint, Apple is going to uh, is starting to crack down um, on um, abuse of uh, you know what data is being collected by app makers. I mean, we saw just at WWDC that um, they're really you know tightening up on what you can gather, what you can collect, what you can share. Uh, and, and I think that um, you know, startups that uh, you know try to push the limit there um, risk uh, you know getting banned entirely from the mm -hmm. platform. I think that Apple is going to take a much tougher mm -hmm. stance going forward. Um, and, you know, you saw what they did with banning uh, you know apps that were abusing MDM, uh, and obviously they you know introduced some new rules of the road, and you have to adhere to them. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I would say just from a business standpoint, even if you were just like a heartless, like, you know, I don't care, uh, I, 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 would, I would be very, very careful about what you do there. Rachel, do you want to say anything about Google? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert in this particular area, but some of my colleagues actually wrote like a really in-depth article, a Google blog post about this particular topic. So rather than like give you a butchered expl explanation, I would uh, definitely check that out. We can we can go on some search engine and, and find that. Yeah, okay. I think so. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, and I, and, I, and I will point out since you brought up the the Quest, uh, the Oculus Quest. If you were to go and Google uh, Oculus's terms of service, I think you would find that they do upload quite a lot of oh, yeah. telemetry, uh, and it is a bit a bit scary because they are they're not yet in sync with what um, their CEO has said about privacy. Uh, they're collecting all of it, and they have said they can use it for anything. They can even use it to market to you. It's permitted by their written terms of service, so something to think about. Um, okay, uh, since we were talking about different hardware, people did ask a few questions about the future. Uh, and uh, for anybody, uh, when do you think we're going to have hands-free AR experiences at scale? Um, and uh, they added a knowledgeable person in a 10K knit world, uh, meaning uh, very bright. Um, also, just to put this out there, there's something we didn't talk about yet was, uh, Rachel and I were talking earlier, that there's additional challenges when the light isn't bright, when it's dark. Uh, machine learning may be trained on the daytime images and all of a sudden things stop, stop working when it's dark out. So maybe talk about um, what you see really quickly, what you see is the future and how long do you think it's going to be before uh, we aren't holding these phones up, but we have other devices that can, that can be better. Um, can we turn this back to you first? I think you have a pretty yeah, interesting you might know around this. I'm the moderator. <laughs> I asked the question. That's a cop out, Abby. Uh, I, I, I'll answer that because I, I, I worked in, in mobile as a smartphone. I worked for the company that invented the mobile phone browser and saw pre iPhone, iPhone, and all that. And, and often when I get asked that question, people are saying, when are we going to get you know, an iPhone 6 type 
you know, device. Um, like something that I'll leave my phone at home and I'll, I'll just wear it all day. And in reality, that, that device is a long way off. The, the interesting question is what are the steps between today and, and that? And I think we're going to see a, um, uh, I'll call it like the iPhone of AR glasses or maybe the Apple Watch of AR glasses is better in that it's the, it's the first version that, that people are kind of willing to buy, but, but still no one's going to buy it. You know, it'll, it'll be like version three or something before people actually start buying it. Um, and you know, my bet is that that first version is is somewhere between, you know, one and a half to two and a half years out uh, from from someone, whether it's whether it's Apple or Snap or Facebook or you know someone else. But that's that's kind of my guess. But at the same time, not everyone's going to buy that device. But people will be like, well, I, I, I might, but I'll wait till the next one. You know. So, anyone else want to take a stab at it? Good. I think it's a ways off. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, look, there was a, 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 somebody in the AR space predicted that 2017 AR, Apple was going to introduce AR glasses, right? Um, I think it's really tempting to say it's just around the corner. Um, but um, there are a lot of things that need to be solved. I mean, uh, you know, we, um, I, I think that, you know, to Matt's point, the glasses are going to be tethered to a, a phone yep. for lots of reasons, um, yep. just to offload processing, you know, connection. Um, the idea that you're just going to have it in a pair of glasses, it's going to be, there's a lot of advancements that need to make in miniaturization and things like that uh, to get that to a place where people are going to be happy. I think the other challenge is going to be um, around um, uh, the interface, right? We talk about being hands-free, but you're still going to use your hands to interact and, and um, you know, making sure that that stuff works really well is hard. Um, I think, uh, you know, Microsoft has made a lot of improvements with the hand gesture interface from HoloLens, the original HoloLens to the HoloLens 2, um, but it still can be really frustrating. And there's a lot of things that don't seem as intuitive and natural as you would really want, and especially with the original HoloLens, which um, I don't know if anybody did that tutorial where they teach you the hand gestures and then you get into the, you know, the main screen and you're just like, I don't remember any of that, <laughs> like what I was taught. Um, and so I, I think that before and, you know, Apple does something, they are going to solve, try to solve a lot of those problems, right? They're going to feel like they need to have uh, made a lot of progress there. And it may, that may be, in some respects, a harder challenge than some of the technical challenges. And I think that that is, um, if you think about why Apple did uh, the iPhone, um, you know, the time they did, it was in part that capacitive touchscreens um, were coming into the market. And Apple was able to define a new f interface and gestures and things like that to take advantage of the capacitive touchscreen. And, um, and I think that they spent a lot of time on that problem. What does it mean to have a capacitive interface uh, and what do you have to design for in terms of, of you know, inputs and things like that? It's going to be the same thing with the AR glasses. Um, but it's, in some ways, probably 10x the challenge. Yeah. I, I think the, the first successful product actually won't solve them. It'll just, they just won't have that yeah, I mean, yeah. It may just be like a, a, you know, basically a watch on your face. It doesn't even have like what we all call AR and um, it'll be those product design decisions about what to leave out but still have something that people want that's going to be the, the you know the, the tough choices I think that that's really like it's so easy for for people to assume that outdoor AR in particular really only comes to fruition like from a consumer experience standpoint um, when you have a display on your face but I it, that's that's a really I think a, a pretty um, big leap of, uh, of, from an assumption standpoint. Basically, you can get pretty far with two cameras that localize you in the world precisely, but where your display is still in your pocket, mm -hmm. right? And now that, uh, that in itself opens up such a huge wealth of... So of when you say you're thinking cameras that can look out or cameras on the phone? Cameras that look out from your face. From your face, yeah. Position you in the world. Or like the snap spectacles that right. have cameras on. And then give you even just audio feed. We, that, we don't even have that yet, mm -hmm. you know? So it's so easy to assume that that, that is naturally the next step, whereas so much you can do that we as developers don't have access to yet, even if we just got lo good localization on people, ambient localization yep. in consumers' yeah. pockets. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a, 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 you know, a lot of potential with, um, you know, the AirPods and the fact that they do have, yeah. you know, accelerometers and, and sensors there to be able to do some real basic spatial localization. And I think the combination of you know, AirPods and um, maybe the watch and um, even, you know, some cameras and things like that will actually, you know, create the ability to, um, you know, do some new kinds of experiences that 
you know, again, it, it may not be about overlaying information in you know, space like AR, but you know, we forget that audio is also part of augmenting our reality. And um, if you're able to do really good localization around audio cues and sound and things like that, there's a lot of really interesting things that can be done. Mm -hmm. Rachel, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, I, I think it's funny when uh, people talk about like AR glasses will solve all of our problems. Right. right. Um, because as a designer, I just think of all like just like you said, ten, like ten x uh, kind of the explorations that we had to do for smartphone AR. It does not solve all of our problems and introduces like uh, lots of new problems. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't have an estimate for like when they'll uh, kind of uh, be more common. But I think from a design perspective, um, just keeping in mind that it's not kind of a magic wand onto uh, the AR world. And I think the key things from all the panelists, none of you are waiting for that. There's things no, that you're no, doing no, today no, no. Right. that right. might get better in the future, but there's plenty, plenty of hard work and challenges to be solved today uh, in order to get this at scale and get this out. There's plenty of like, market opportunity today. We're not, we're not just researchers like, you know, with their heads down working. There's, there's customers' problems that we can yeah, solve. I, I would say that, that, you know, you have a canvas to work with that has we barely painted even a corner of. Uh, and, and so um, there's just so much to take it, you know, that can be done just with phones right now. Yeah, great. Um, so we are at 8.25, and so uh, right on time for the question and answer. We're going to uh, wrap up. Cool. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. Thanks for all your answers. Yeah.